what Jokul had gone do. Everyone comfortable? We would like to welcome our foreign partners to this conference. Thank you for being with us. Um, it's a, it will be a very interesting discussion. We will also be having presentations and, and uh, speakers explaining about the developing innovative tools about gender diversity for parents and adult educators. The interesting thing about this conference is we'll be focusing from a different perspective. It's, we will be focusing on the feelings and emotions um, from the parents' perspective, from uh, the adult educators, and that's what we'll be discussing also in the discussion happening soon. We'll be having partners as well, uh, explaining what happened in the focus groups and also in the masterclass. But first and foremost, we would like to invite over our key no, speaker, Matthew Bartolo, to explain more about the findings after the focus groups and masterclass. Kindly put your hands together for Matthew. Thank you. It's, it's an, I, I was feeling anxious and, and excited at the same time this morning because for me, creating this space is extremely important. This space was created because at willingness in both our gender clinic and our sex clinic, we talk a lot about gender diverse minors and we're always asking how does that impact the family, the system. So we decided to come up with this project to explore more in detail and in depth questions and situations that the family and educators working with gender diverse youth go through with the idea of creating an ever growing, ever evolving digital tool that can be there for people who have questions, have doubts. <coughs> So what we did was we teamed up with five different partners from different countries. So there's Janus from Italy, who's mostly um, responsible for the website, the digital tool, the technical side of the digital tool, but also the research and the focus groups and master classes that were carried out step by step, which is a Croatian organization that works very closely with parents Mintis Betis, which is another organization in Lithuania, and they work very closely with families, all types of families. A Polish university, whose name I spent the last 30 minutes trying to understand how to pronounce, but the lovely partners accepted me to just say Polish university, who is the academic partner in this um, research and uh, um, uh, innovative tool project and future and perspective in Ireland who also works a lot on these kind of projects of creating um, tools to be used by the general public. This started 18 months ago with focus groups in every country so we ran focus groups with parents and focus groups with educators in all of these countries. We then met in Poland to do a thematic analysis of these focus groups and understand what were the main concerns, main questions that educators and parents have around this topic. It was not, and on purpose we excluded parents of gender diverse children because the focus is the general public. The whole idea behind this project is to offer a space for the general public to ask questions respectfully, but still all kinds of questions to understand better what kind of education is needed to help the general public 
mostly parents and educators, become more empathic and more understanding towards the different genders and different realities that people are going through. From this thematic analysis, we came up with the themes and we created a Train the Trainer course, which is readily available on YouTube, where all the different partners answered these questions in a way that educators can use these videos and the guidebook to then train and teach parents or other educators. So there is that as well, and from that, we tried piloted master classes in all of the countries with parents and educators to understand better how we can improve the train the trainer course that is available online. Today we're here to create a space for everyone in this room to ask questions, to engage in a discussion, and then at the end of this conference we're going to present the digital tool which is still a baby with the promise from willingness that we're going to keep updating it and improving it. So the main focus for this conference and this space and obviously this project is to understand the needs of the parents and the educators. How are we doing this? We're doing this by creating this space. So be it the focus groups, be it the train the trainer course, be it the master class. And now even this, the idea is to offer a space where people can be frank and ask any kind of question. And it's coming because we are living in a space, in, a, in my opinion, a very interesting time where anyone who has an opinion can become a social influencer and can share any kind of opinion. Sometimes even being sold as research or as facts. And I think it's our responsibility as professionals to teach the general public how to understand what is a fact and what is a strong opinion. So when we are working on this project, we do keep all these different opinions in mind. Because unless we address them, our youth, our adults, will be hearing all these different opinions and make them out to be facts. And the great thing about social media and, me and digital media is that it has this beautiful algorithm that keeps giving you what you are looking for. So if at the moment I'm planning a trip to Sicily, I keep getting all sorts of restaurants, all sorts of hotels that are available in Sicily, which help me because it makes my looking for things easier. But at the same time, when it comes to ideology, we are more than ever before just confirming what we already think. So if I think that the situation in our country is caused by an establishment or caused by a government, chances are that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Google will keep confirming what I already believe. To the extent that the comments that have come up first under Times of Malta, Malta Today, and all the other news outlets, would be the ones that I agree with my opinion. So this project was built with this in mind, that we need to create, as professionals, now more than ever, we need to share our knowledge in the public domain so that people can 
choose if they want to go to factual research sources. So this space today has no rainbows, has no beliefs. I mean, we all have our own beliefs, but we don't have an agenda. Our agenda is very simple. It's to understand what you guys think and feel and what kind of questions do you think need to be addressed in our digital tool. <clears throat> and then our responsibility is to find the solid research that answers those questions. And during the master class, I found myself saying quite often, I'm not confident answering this question because the research that there is is not longitudinal, or the research that there is is not big enough, in my opinion, to be factual in my answers. So part of this journey for myself was also to understand that Although there's a lot of research nowadays, it's all baby research and it's very important for us to keep this in mind. It is a topic that instills a lot of emotions. And I know we say this in PSHE as well, all emotions are welcome. And we say this in therapy as well, all emotions are welcome. I'd like to add something to that, all emotions and thoughts are welcome, because most of the time, thoughts are coming from your own emotions anyway. Emotions are triggers in our psyche, in our body, to help us with our self-preservation. So whatever emotion you go through, it's a message that your body, your mind is giving you to act in a certain way to take care of yourself. Unfortunately, personally, as a professional, I am seeing that in our society today, we're just stopping there. We're feeling the emotion, and we're say, taking that as a fact. And even when I'm following discussions about this topic, I still hear people say, but this is how I feel, full stop. It's like if I feel this way about this topic, then it is a fact. Sadness. It's a topic that does instill sadness in some people. The reason why we feel sadness is to get empathy from the people around us. So when people feel sad, sometimes we cry, Sometimes we show the sadness through our body. It's perfectly okay, because that is our way to get attention from the people around us, so that we get their attention, get their empathy, and hopefully get their support. So if this topic instills in you sadness, that's okay as well. What I'd like to encourage you to do is, there's our team, here, there's our numbers. If you feel that you need to talk about this, especially if it was caused by this space, do talk about it, okay? I feel it's our responsibility, if we're creating this space, to take care of you after this. So if you're feeling sad because of this, it's okay, support is here, you can ask for support. Fear. What does fear do? Fear gives you a shot of adrenaline, amongst other hormones that prepare your body to fight. And no matter what people say, history has taught us that when we see something that we don't know, something which is new, it could be a skin color, it could be a different age, it could be a different shape, we will feel fear. And fear is there so that our body gets ready to fight, flight, freeze, or fall. But in this case, let's focus on fight or flight. Again, it is a topic that can instill fear. And we hear this from people saying, 
اطفال تانه کن آزم هنگام پنگر فشوم دیشه ها جلی خا تمرکز سری ال اطفال تی ای کیف خانه پروتیج اطفال تی ای How am I going to protect my kids from this? How are these books going to affect my children? Which is very normal to feel fear, because fear is coming from as a result of novelty. Now, for some of us, gender diversity is a new topic. It's not a new topic in society, because we go back many years even with our research and we can see that it existed even since there was scripture, I mean literature, right? But for some of us, the truth is it's new. Okay, if I'm teaching at a school in a town, in a village, yes, the first trans child, the first gender diverse child, the first non-binary child is new for the whole system. And as a teacher, as a head teacher, it's a new experience. And that new experience will instill fear. And that is okay as well. It's your body, your mind preparing you to face this new thing. The thing with our brain is that it doesn't distinguish between a new animal like a bear or a lion, which is going to devour me alive, but it would be cholesterol, <laughs> <laughs> or a non-binary 10-year-old. Okay, but it's not because it's my brain, it's how our brain works. Disgust. It's interesting that disgust is there, especially for self-preservation, so that if there's something I've never seen before, I won't eat it. And if there is a kind of person I've never seen before, my disgust, which can lead to me trying to shame that person, is our social way of getting people in line. So for a very long time, disgust and shame was used by society because we needed to put people in line to preserve society. We're talking about a society that did not have enough basic needs, like shelter, like food. Our lifestyle evolved, most of us, but our brain is still reacting to what was needed in society back then. But it's also, and I, when I was doing this presentation, I deleted and undeleted the slide so many times because I felt it's a big word, disgust, when we're talking about other human beings. But if I'm standing here saying all emotions are welcome, I would be cheating you guys and myself if I don't add this as well. And anger. Again, as part of our social norms and taking care of our society, anger is a very normal, natural reaction to injustice. So if we believe there is an injustice happening in our society, we will feel angry. Before we used to go down to the streets, nowadays we curb that anger, we feel better about ourselves, if we write a comment on their Times of Malta um, article. We feel that we've done enough. But anger is a very natural reaction to injustice. Again, to help us as a society take care of each other and our society. So this is the why of our project. So now, um, Claire Jus Ordway will be moderating a panel discussion and she will be introducing the panelists who will start a conversation with the intent that we discuss it all together after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. So I would like to welcome our 
welcome our guests. Please put Hello. Okay. Please put your hands together for Christine Sherry, educator and life coach, post-secondary guidance counselor for eight years, head of school for another eight years. Our second guest is Karen Mitzi. She has two daughters, age seven and eleven years old. Daughters start being exposed to and understanding the extent of gender diversity within their school community. We have also Silvana Attard, mother of a transgender son, educator, activist, representative of parents and transgender children within the Rainbow Family Network. Christina Camilleri, educator of personal social health education in secondary school for the past 15 years. And last but not least, Oriana Vidal, learning support educator for the past 16 years, and LSC within nurtured groups at primary level for the past eight years, a mother of two daughters. Kifahna. All good? Good, good, good. Um, my first question to you would be, it's a discussion, so you can intervene whenever you like. My first question would be, what do you think of discussing from this perspective? from the parents and from the adult educators' perspective. What do you think of such a conference? Can I, can I start with Mela, Mela, Mela? I can start with you. Mela, Mela, Mela. If you feel comf more comfortable speaking in Maltese, we'll be switching, Mela. Hello, hello, hello. We'll be switching slightly in Maltese, not all times, but we will be translating in English as well. Nishin is asiko. L'importanza che mi vale dal ne discuto di ne ne discuto zonta non ha trabil. Ne ne discuto. Hello, hello, hello. Ne ne discuto mi perspettiva tal perenza na il collo ne se mau bis ne lo o è quando il con l'elmena dei men da un il fazit men te si l'elmena te sati o is dal ne discuto mi perspettiva tal genitori o tal educatori bis ne Tal maduar, isom ikolom paci malimoshin staho. Digi ya misto siya di. Mela, halip tani diskul, halip tani diskul tni min na hati ay palay do katur. Uwa importante lni sa mau el el student yena min na hati ay. Ashina merkel hin kolo andi el 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 kontat mal student ti ay. Importante lni tisma. Trittara l-emozzjonijiet. Trittara u koll xinu għaddej u il-biza tal-student f'dak il-kas li forsi għan kas-ħabu tal-klassi l-għallima mux ħajif muħ. Aħna fil-departement taħna m-miktar ħin biex n-diskutu innatu l-spazju. Min emmek tajjeb li weħet jifem mkoll li ħajkun emman ka il-biza forsi għanka tal-ġenitubri min naħa tal-ġeneri il-public min naħa tal-tanjiz sejajdu fuq t-tifel, fuq t-tifla għad għasir the transition xsejġi u min li studenti tal-madwar even from the students in his class so we have to keep them into consideration as well good, can I ask you? I think as a topic in general, it evokes anxiety automatically, whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, it has the same effect. Um, and everyone is coming from a different background, from a different perspective in their lives. So when we get students in class, they are already coming in with their own baggage, with their own information, what they've been told at school or at home. So it does evoke a lot of anxiety, but I think the most, and Matthew mentioned it when he, when he was discussing why it's being done, I think the most important thing to teach them is how to put their perspectives forward, how to discuss it openly, and how to make them feel that their emotions and their thoughts about this topic are valid without feeling ashamed or embarrassed or am I going to say the wrong things? Exactly. Because that's what it brings about. It does bring about a lot of anxiety. And that's very interesting. And I would like to ask Silvana. Silvana is a person I've been interviewing for, for quite some time. And I'm really comfortable asking all the questions because she's very open. She's a very passionate activist about this subject. But this time I will be asking you some different questions because you've been through this all along. 
if I had to ask you, and I remember you coming with your son in my program and him saying about his emotions, if I had to ask you about his friends, for example, let's start from his classmates. Did your son go to a girl's school, a boy's school? What was it? Can you explain? So my son um, attended co-ed school. Okay. It was a state school. Um, currently he is um, at university. It's his first year at university. Wow. Um, he came out as transgender when he was in middle school. Um, so he was year seven. And initially, sort of, we kept it between the walls of our house because we wanted to give him time to process things himself, himself and process things ourselves as family. But when he finally decided that he wanted to socially transition, and that means tell outside, tell the society, listen, I'm going to use these pronouns now and I'm going to change my name. I have chosen my preferred name. Um, uh, obviously, we had to go out there and tell the ones around us that we'll be using these preferred pronouns and the chosen name, the new chosen name. And obviously, um, we had to go to school also. Luckily enough, um, my perspective is that we were lucky as a family, as I think Miles did everything the right way, sort of. He didn't come out to his friends first. I mean, it was his choice, but he came out to us first. So it gave us time to put everything in place, uh, to look out for professional help. You know, we were supported by family therapists and social workers. And um, when we had to go to school, we did it during the summer. So everything would be fine when he started his last scholastic year. Because by then he was in form five. He was going to start form five when he socially transitioned. And I remember setting up, sending tens of emails, you know, copying people. And at first we thought we were going to find an obstacle with the head of the school because she wasn't replying back. And thankfully enough, the head of school changed because I think we would have encountered an obstacle. And then you had came in and we set up a meeting and um, we were lucky. This head was a former PSCD teacher. I remember we were accompanied by a professional also who offered to come with us at the meeting. And he told my son, listen, I don't know you before. I know Miles now, and for me, you're Miles. Wow. Luckily enough, although he attended a state school, and we hear a lot of things, sometimes negative things about state schools, especially in the school he attended, they also had a gender-neutral bathroom. Okay. So he was very lucky in that aspect, mm -hmm. because not all schools um, have gender neutral bathrooms. And his, he attended a co ed school, which Miles always said this was a blessing, education becoming co ed, because I, I don't know how I would have coped in a girl's school, okay, okay. even before he started middle exactly. school. And um, I have to admit that everything ran smoothly apart. It was COVID time, so initially they forgot about it <laughs> because he hadn't legally changed his name yet because he waited till 16, and he was a couple of months away from his 16th birthday. But when he came out to his friends, I mean, my opinion is that when you are so assertive and you're so strong and you you have no shame in showing others who you really are. True. The others were so embracing. It was only a couple of people who sort of imposed issues with him being transgender. Mm -hmm. And he attends extracurriculum activities, so he, 
he didn't encounter any particular issues, only like maybe one or two incidents with which he tackled himself. <laughs> um, and I remember him one day saying, if you have issues with that particular boy, tell me because I'll come and maybe discuss things with him. And he said, no, I'll handle it myself. And thank for, as you as you're mentioning, um, Miles did things in order. And thankfully enough, he had you as parents. And that's why I think you're so passionate about this thing, because you tackled it together, and it's amazing. But I'm sure other people reach out to you, and it's not as easy. If I may mention, if you allow me, I just watched a series this weekend. It was horrifying. Um, for those of you who would like to search it, it's called Miriam. Um, the death of a reality star. And the story is about um, putting six men in a, in a home, um, like this grande fratello and whatever we see, and then they put this lady, they have to fall in love and they end up winning, winning at the end. But the lady was a, a transgender and they didn't tell them. And you can, in the series, they uh, they relate the, her life story, and she wasn't as lucky as Miles was, and that is the reality, I guess. So what I would like to ask you is how important, because I'm sure a lot of parents reach out to you because things are not as smooth as they are. Some parents find it difficult. I know some mothers who have reached out to me, they find it really hard to tell their husband. So I would like to ask you the importance of now tackling this idea, tackling the emotions, the raw emotions that happen to people who come across such situations? Mela, initially it wasn't easy. Okay. So even myself as a parent, I never started at this place I am. So since he was very, very young, at a very tender age, I had observed things like he was more prone to play with boys we usually associate with toys we usually associate with boys so i used and at that time when he was very young i didn't even know the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity so since he was more prone to play with boy stuff and the way he presented himself was very masculine um, even though i tried <laughs> even to put dresses on him. Uh -huh. um, Which is normal at the end of the day. I won't, if I had to start from the beginning, going through all the experience, I wouldn't have done it. Okay. No, I really regret it. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I had to be at peace with myself and tell myself and my son, listen, I have made mistakes. Like every parent. And at first, um, since I didn't know even the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity, I, I would say to my husband, listen, our child would be gay. Okay. You know? Because I didn't know the difference, honestly. I knew about transgender people. I had heard and I knew personally some, but I didn't know the difference. And um, when my son came out at the age of 11, um, he came out as transgender, so he wasn't confused at all. <laughs> I thought he was confused. I thought, like later when we spoke, um, I said, I think you're mixing things up. And he said, Mom, not. I'm transgender. I'm like, he claimed in front of many professionals that when his brother was born and he wasn't even three, um, he claimed that that's the moment he knew he wasn't a boy. He wasn't biologically a boy. Okay. Because he saw the difference when we were changing his brother's nappies. So at the back of his mind, he was a boy. Good, good. And sort of, it was a process for me, you know? It was a learning experience for me. But I had to be open to learn and I had to be open to listen, not only to my son, uh -huh. but to other gender diverse youths, especially. You know, because they all come up with different experiences. 
some of them really painful experiences, suffering most, the gender diverse youth suffer from gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. which is like devastating, you know? Some go through self-harm. Can you explain to us what is gender dysphoria? Um, gender dysphoria is when um, the individual experiences this sort of hate okay. towards uh, mm -hmm. certain body parts, you know? So I always recount how my son was really a good swimmer and a good water polo player. Wow. But he stopped swimming because of gender dysphoria. He hated his chest. And unfortunately, he had large chest, which he used to bind, we used to cover with UV tops. But he, could, he used to tell me, Ma, like, I cannot go to swim, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He used to bind himself. And I was sort of resistant initially. I thought, no, we won't get the binders. I think they will hurt you. His safety at the time was more important than his well-being for me. And that hurts because his well-being should be the priority, you know, for a parent. And until one day I found him sort of bandaging himself. And I said, no, that's even more worse. We'll buy binders. Okay. <laughs> until finally, thankfully, he had his top surgery last October. Good. Good. So Thank he's you. free. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll keep on discussing. Of course, I would like to ask the guest near you. You're a mother of two daughters. Yes. How do you discuss this issue? And I would like to ask you the same question about the importance of focusing from this perspective. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, even if such a topic, we would like to put it at the back burner as a family, for example, and not talk about it. Nowadays, children, are aware, they are on social media, they get to see things. So even if we decide not to tackle such topics, they're there. True. So although my experience is very different to Silvana, because mm -hmm. um, they, they seem to know their, their gender, uh -huh. but they still raise the topic because they see their friends, they see their role models, and um, they see their classmates, we were saying. So for us, and personally for me and my husband, it's very important to talk about this topic because it's the society that they're living in. Fantastic. And it's the values that we want to bring them up in that they are I wouldn't say tolerate, because tolerate, it's like, <laughs> it's, a, it's, yeah, a bad it's OK, uh, exactly. get on the boat, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be curious about the people you're with. Um, this morning, I was reflecting a bit, because my experience on the topic is not that we haven't lived it. But um, the, the, the genders, W w w the society is so ingrained, like if you just research gender on, on social media, you get the, the, the gender reveal, for instance. Mm -hmm. the, the child is not even born yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the family, and uh, for instance, in the Maltese context, we're still uh, with the extended families and everyone involved. We already set it in our mind, oh, OK, this child which is going to be born is going to be a girl or a boy. Okay. And for me that hinders already the parenting journey. Because like I don't know if she would like arts or sports or maths or English, I think as a parent I should keep an open stance to know this child. Mm -hmm. You know, to be curious about her, you know. Okay. I'll be asking questions okay. to create debate. And maybe I won't use the right, the right words, but I'm thinking from the perspective of someone watching and listening. gender I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, okay. but we should reflect 
on the possible impact. You know, every decision we make has a, um, an impact okay. on life. E even the good ones, which we, we think are very good, sometimes can have a, an impact which we did not want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, cool. you know, as a, as a couple, we should think about the implication or what it could mean in 10 years' time or in 15 years' time. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but at least we should think about it before we do it. Very good, and that's very interesting to discuss. But I would like to ask Christine before. We mentioned, Christine, you work, you're, you're a guidance teacher, a life coach. We, we mentioned the fact that our kids are very much exposed through TikTok. And did you see a difference um, when you come across these type of situations from a little bit back in the years and now? Okay, yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, um, I think, Silvana, it has been a pleasure for me to hear you. There is this, this demeanor of yours, which is, I mean, obvi obviously, it, your child is secure. He's, he's, <laughs> and, and you have created this space. And, and I think we do, um, we do have the privilege of meeting parents like you, but if there were more, then we would have <laughs> less need for a lot of people, uh, a lot of professionals <laughs> present over here. Um, it's, uh, yes, way back when I was working at a sixth form as a guidance counselor, um, I remember um, uh, this young woman who uh, is, is non-binary, and I remember her parents struggling because she refused to wear um, a dress for graduation, from sixth form. And um, they're a lovely family. Um, but but I, I remember the father struggling, he was struggling really. He, he, could, he, could, exactly. he couldn't fathom this, this, my child is going to wear a suit. Exactly. I mean, a suit, a jeffery. Um, so there was pain, there, there was real pain. I mean, there was so much love, but also so much pain. And very often the pain is also um, because you are concerned about the child's, uh, your, your daughter, your son, our child, sorry, I mentioned child, we're talking about a 17, 18 year old. Um, so, so you're always concerned of how will, will my child suffer more in society? So there's always this concern as well. But um, yes, I've seen this change because I remember I accompanied this person and I always say accompany because this is ultimately what we can do both within as educators, as, as my previous speakers here, as parents in reality, and, and also as uh, educational leaders now taking my role from head of school, because um, we can only accompany people. Um, we cannot force them in different directions, okay? Um, so we have to create systems which are, which allow them to be whoever they are meant to be. Um, but going back to your uh, question, there were changes because obviously social media does and, and unless we are going to create the discussion um, and the safe space for a child to speak up and uh, question their, uh, their, if they have issues with gender and, and we have to create that space and we are responsible in schools to create that space as much as a parent is responsible at home to also create that space. Okay. Um, so we need sensitive leadership on in every school there are sensitive individuals who, who are more, of course, more trained as well, like the PSC, the teachers and the guidance teachers. Um, but we also need sensitive leadership to um, permit that the school in its, in its climb, in its, in its ethos, in its uh, culture, there is this space to actually um, discuss in a safe environment because we don't want kids to discuss, to disclose prematurely. True. So the climate at school, so I, I remember as a head of school, I always, something is very, very important for me, it was that let us be attentive and each person needs to be attentive. It's not only the guidance teachers who need to be attentive. Every 
person prior to them being a teacher of maths, a teacher of physics, a teacher, you are there for the human, you are there for the person. Exactly, and that is fantastic. Now I'm going to be blunt here. <laughs> In the sense, right now I'm going through a story, for those who know I do this program about parenting, and I'm going through the story, Silvana, which is hurting me every day because um, there is this particular lady, she has a son, and he's identifying as a female, but his father won't understand at all. And the things he's doing to me, I would go, <laughs> it's not enough. So I get so angry that he's not understanding, and he won't permit, he will make his son's life miserable for sure. But looking at it from another perspective and trying to be understanding. Are we understanding the parents' perspective, the, those people who in our eyes are not in the right frame of mind because they say, this is not normal, um, why am I feeling so angry, why my son is dead and there's another daughter. Are we understanding their perspective? I, I <laughs> think that, as you said, even your anger towards the spirit is legitimate. And as Matthew was saying, emotions, I mean, and, and you know, emotions are um, there. And our thoughts come from the way our own, how we imagine our children to be. I think, I think, uh, all of us have an idea of, I'm sure you had an idea, Uncle Fatli exactly. used to dress her, try to dress her, because we have this idea of, we even dream. Sometimes we, we got in, in guidance, I know there are various people here who, who, who have experienced this. We want, we see that parents, some parents want their children to do this, to be this, let alone when they're questioning, who they, um, who their biological, uh, um, who they, if they are biologically female, obviously they're, as if they're questioning that, they're already trying to fit this female, not only in her role uh, as, as female, but also, so imagine that man who has maybe uh, a very stereotyped, um, but cut I, I don't want to label him either, because even that's labeling, really. Uh, but he has this particular mindset, which has come from his family of origin. Uh, he has always lived, so other cars, uh, so exactly. he, has to, he has to drive, so we buy him a big motor car with the battery, the bigger the better, and the less he shows interest in the car, we buy him a nice big car, so that we, we, we you know, um, but it is, a process which the father has also to go through, and we can't make it faster. We have to, exactly. so long as it is not hurting the child unnecessarily. But we have seen in schools, I have experienced as a head of school, um, uh, um, uh, it was an, I was a head of school of a, a girls' school. Okay, so this is not um, the same situation, which is poses more challenges, I believe. Um, challenges in people's mindsets are present throughout, in whichever school you, you, you are and whichever institution, because it's uh, whoever is in school is, is a, a portion of the population, so they have ideas. But so, but in a in a in a girls' school, it is obviously uh, more challenging. Luckily, uh, this child. Um, started questioning and there was the, the space for, for her to question and the mother was very, um, like you, very willing to act, a timshi matiflaj, very willing to um, um, try to accompany her daughter, her son today because, uh, okay. so, and we did uh, create the space. Luckily today as well, schools do have, uh, I see a number of people here as well who work within the sector supporting schools, be it in the um, public sector and the church school sector. Okay, because even church schools are, are, are very uh, attuned and very um, much, there's a lot of training, a lot of awareness to heads, of schools, so the heads of schools, it's a, 
Isushi, and I, I came from a background of guidance counseling, so that was, that was me. But some heads do not come from backgrounds which are in the people deal, you know, in the people. But exactly. So you can find the like challenge even through teachers and educators. Exactly. Teachers. But Silas teachers is. become heads as well. Exactly. So and, and not all teachers come from the sector of PSCD and, and, the, and the LSC sector. So um, so they might need more. True. So I know that in in all in all sectors there is training to because knowledge sometimes fear comes from not knowing. Uh, so it is important to explain to True. people. In fact, Silvana mentioned she said. Uh, Thankfully, the head of school changed and things were easier. So, uh, do you find it challenging even with maybe um, workers, co-workers who do not understand? Can you explain to us about this? Mm -hmm. If I can mention something. Yes. Sure. Um, I'm coming from a private school. And uh, our heads have always been extremely supportive. But something that we find very challenging is various religious backgrounds, for example which you cannot, um, I mean, we would never try and change a child's mind. That's not what we do in PSAG. I believe we try and um, teach them respect for all. And, but when a child is coming from a background that at home, their religious background is so strong and ingrained in them from when they're children, it's extremely difficult for that child to become more open-minded, for example, or to use even the right language and the, the right... We've had situations where the parents, for example, ask us, I don't want my child sitting in that lesson. Oh my God. And obviously, and then the school has to make a decision on how to go about that. Mila, Silvana wants to say something. Um, regarding the religious background, I don't want to sound like I'm being judgmental, but I want to share my experience. Um, as many of, multi, of other Maltese families, we were brought up Catholic. My husband, so Miles' father, um, is very religious, is very active, and still is in the parish church. And my kids were both very involved. After he socially transitioned Miles, he still remained an altar server. And um, the priests knew. They were addressing him with, with his new name and new pronouns, and he remained an altar server till 17. So I think I can say sometimes this is coming up as an excuse. My husband, more than myself, is very religious. He was raised playing, um, pretending he's, he's doing masses. All he did was playing with statues and all. Um, so, I mean, and both my, my kids, as I said, were very involved, but we were open because we were always open to different realities, even before it hit at home, you know? Um, so we always embrace diversity because religion is also about love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever encountered someone very religious but who opposed, who people said no? no I way. think my son has shared something with me that happened during the religion classes, you know? And I once, I remember I emailed his teacher and I said, I, I expressed my thoughts sort of, because he used to say I discuss a lot. <laughs> and he said, no, but I like the way he discuss things because they are sort of, he knows what he's going to say. He's not ju just saying them out of nowhere, but, we never encountered any difficulties, you know, even when we attend church ceremonies. So even like some of our relatives have really have very strong religious background and sort of because our priority is to love our child, you know, actually no one popped up this problem of exactly. being so religious. I would like to ask the educator, and also you, Silvana, you, you mentioned that Miles used to go to uh, Cohen school. Would you think it would have been much more challenging 
tipo if he went to an all girls school or an all boys school and would you as educators think it would be more challenging for someone to go in an all girls school maybe and to come out I think it is a little bit a little bit more challenging since when the student transition let's take for example an all girls school if uh, this individual is transitioning, so is presenting themselves as males. Uh, it, it's up to the school exactly. sometimes that uh, they embrace uh, mm -hmm. this new thing in their school. But it happens, and I know that it happened even in church schools. Uh, okay. Okay. It happens, so it's not sort of, it, it cannot be done, you know. I know some youths that they had their last uh, secondary year in the school and they gave the option that the child continues their, their scholastic journey in the school. Mm -hmm. Good. You would um, like to yes, yes. add, sure, sure, um, add to this? Uh, in fact, um, this particular young man, um, we had his ECDL certificate changed um, to, you know, we, we just read the, the process, the, the school leaving certificate change, we collaborated with the, the education department because obviously it, it was a church school, but, um, and, and it's no hassle. I, I, I think one of the most important thing is be it a, it's okay, there are policies in school, but policies are there to serve people. So policies, um, it need to be inclusive and need to be, um, adapted according to the needs. Uh, something that you both mentioned about, I, I can't not say it, maybe because I am a, a practicing Catholic myself and the ex-head of a, a church school and I am involved. I, I think there's this sometimes wrong assumption about what it is to be a Catholic. is about being accepting. So I, I, I would... It is obvious for me that in a church school you do accept um, a child because you're there to walk with every child. Um, I think it's a very old way of seeing the, the Catholic faith as in one which is um, limiting or a set of rules. We're talking about love and relationships sure. and building a relationship, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I think as this, this is our duty, not only within a Catholic school, every school, but to hide behind religion, as you said, I think it is people are hiding behind it to say that a so would a so you know, it's it's fear. I think there's a lot of fear. True. Uh -huh. um, uh, Christine mentioned a word that stuck to my head: the word policy. So the schools have policies, but at home, <laughs> we don't have policies about this topic. You know, we might have a list of values that we would like to. So, although I am logically with Christine, because as I mentioned earlier, our aim is to support the child, but often as parents, we're still left at a loss of how shall I address this? Mm -hmm. uh, if I may, Silvana, they, your support system sounds like very strong. But let's not forget that there are single mothers, there are single fathers, there are teenage parents True. who are still developing themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. And speaking about myself, my maturity now is not what I was <laughs> when I was my 16. Lama. So let's keep in mind that there are these difficulties, you know, um, our culture is changing. We're, we're facing many people uh, coming to live here. So their background is also different. Let's not forget these people as well, yeah. you know? So in my opinion, I respect Sylvan a lot and I think their journey is beautiful, but I don't think it's everyone's reality, you know? So I think that's why the space is good that we have we have to admit it's not that easy, you know. If you ask me now, it, when you go home, your, your child will, will open up. Most probably the first thing I will do is I will look into my own support system. In this case, probably it would be Silvana. It's the only person I know. Like, Silvana, this happened, what shall I do? But there are many people who don't know, like even us as parents, 
Okay. You know, ma, um, we still go to our own parents for advice, exactly, exactly. let alone if we don't have a support system in the first place, if we don't have friends who have lived this, I think the first thing would be a crisis exactly. in the family. Exactly. I'm going to ask you something, but before I go to that, I'm sure, Silvana, you've met stories of people who don't know what to do, their emotions, and even maybe things they told you might have angered you. However, you can understand also their frustration and anger. Um, and it happened to me also. Ah. So when my son came out, even though I had observed so many things since he was very young, like I said before, <coughs> at first I cried. Okay. I cried my eyes out. In fact, my kids used to call me waterworks. <laughs> Here comes the waterworks. I used to cry in front of every professional. I don't know. The, on, the endocrinologist saw me crying. You know? oh my, but it's, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but it's normal, normal, you know? Obviously. And what uh, struck me the most from the emotions is fear. Because... Uh, what I was feeling back then, at the very beginning, was fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of the unknown, fear of what was going to happen out there when we went out there. Between the walls of our house, he was protected and Safe. he was loved. But out there, what was going to happen with his friends, you know, when he, uh, when he goes for scouts meetings? He was, as I said, he was an altar server. How are we going to say the priest, the youth group, you know? He was involved in so many things, the band club, and sort of um, the one who used to teach him was really old, in his 70s. And I had to explain to him, you know? How was it? No, it was fine. Uh, listen, <laughs> what a tip I used when I when I told all our relatives and the most the, the closest persons to us because then social media social media yeah. counts did the rest because he as soon as we told our, our our closest relatives he changed his name on social media and that was it. Um, we explained briefly without giving excessive details, you know, so we said, like, our cause, my cause used to, because I always joke with my son and tell him, you did one or two coming out, the rest I did them myself. <laughs> uh -huh. I used sort of, ma, listen, today, you know, I have the youth group, oh, just call the priest and tell him that it smiles now, he, him pronouns, okay, I'll call the priest. <laughs> but, uh, but that is something beautiful, Silvana. Him being so comfortable with you. But it took me years. I have, okay. It took me a couple of years, sort of, because this is a process also for the parents. So I don't want to pass on the message that if you're a parent and you're struggling with this thing, Proceed. I mean, it's not always, yeah, I was not always this person who is sitting in front of you. I cried, I asked, I looked for information, I followed other gender diverse people, I read books, ordered books, did anything in my possibilities. Like I always say, Miles is my search engine. <laughs> so even if I read something, I go and say, listen, Miles, I read this. Uh -huh. You know, how do you, what do you think about this? And we discuss things, you know, even before coming here last weekend, we discussed this <laughs> conference a lot and mm -hmm. sort of he gave me his point of views. And, um, but as we said, I mean, it's okay to feel afraid and I didn't know where to go. This is another thing. You know, we hear about um, gay movements and stuff and I knew about them but I never thought what kind of support they would offer. So when my son one day called me after a couple of years, after the coming out letter, and he said, Ma, I want to talk to you, and I knew it was serious. <laughs> and he said, like, Ma, we have to do something about this because I cannot take this anymore. And I was like, oh God, this is an alarm. You know, if I, I won't do something now, his well-being will be deteriorating, you know? And I sort of, okay, I'll call the pediatrician.
because I didn't know where to start from. Where, where, where should I go, you know? He's saying he feels like a boy, but what can I do? Biologically, he's not a boy. So we started with the pediatrician. Luckily enough, we had a very good pediatrician which guided us appropriately, and then help came in. We were contacted by the gender well-being clinic, etc., and that's where and now, the journey And now you're helping started. others yourself. <laughs> yes, sometimes, like, like you said, you know, this, this is important that people know that this is a process for us parents, this is also a process, a learning experience. And other parents like look for support, especially through networks where there are other parents of transgender youths or gender diverse youths. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are, they are in a very raw place. You know, I remember one, one parent coming in and saying, why are you so happy? You shouldn't be happy, <laughs> you know? But then you see them evolving. Wow. And sometimes, you know, I tell, you've come a long way. I remember you crying all the time. Now, like, you, you speak so highly about your child, you know? And these were the same parents that said, I'm ashamed when, when she comes to the supermarket with me. I'm afraid people will notice she's transgender. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you have to be open, open, you know? Open to the process. You wanted to comment, and then I, I have yes. a question. Um, uh, Silvana mentioned the, the organizations that we can reach to. As a parent, and I might be wrong, but sometimes the social media um, portrays these organizations as a bit you know, it could be overwhelming to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's almost like, I know it's not the case, but like over promotion. So for people who, who tend to be a little bit more traditional, mm -hmm. it's like they're afraid to touch those waters. True. Mm -hmm. So that's my, okay. my that's opinion. Thing, yes. I would like to ask you because you teach in a, <coughs> Primary school. Okay. Um, do you think there is enough awareness, even in a primary school? I don't. Do you encounter such challenges or things? Are you preparing the kids for no. water? No. No. The simple answer is no. Um, unfortunately, schools tend to be more academic oriented. Mm -hmm. There's all the time academics. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, there won't be uh, always training. Okay. There is the need of training when Even it comes to educators. <coughs> there are people uh, you obviously cannot change easily, but um, you can always have an open discussion when you have the COPE sessions at schools. You start to see um, certain educators that they are not open to change. Mm -hmm. There's also, as they mentioned before, the fear of change, the fear of unknown. We had instances of students who were exposing themselves as being trans transgender at, um, uh, at year six level. Okay. I only meant uh, I only met this for once. Okay. Um, at year six level. Not everyone was supportive, and as uh, she mentioned before, we are there for humans. That's our first interest. So there, there should be, you start getting the counselors and, and having discussions, but as educators, mm -hmm. we need to have, um, if, if we find difficulties, we find or, or we look for the support system. We need support system at times. You cannot say, okay, I can do this without looking for, for, uh, for support. Okay. There is also, you don't know about the subject, you don't know about the topic, so you ask. Mm -hmm. um, something that I wanted to mention before, when she was talking about the parents, one, the parents, um, not everyone is supportive, or there, there starts to be the first, the mother or the father, they do come along, but it's, it's not an easy process. We cannot ask everyone to be on board 
at one go. There needs to be the process for the, for the parents to, to, mm -hmm. to take it in, to engage in this journey. It's, it's not an easy journey. I mean, there, there are parents who are scared about the stigma. And as I mentioned before, there is a process. True, true. There you is. want to talk, and then I'll come to you. Uh -huh. um, I think what sometimes people in general forget is that even for educators, sometimes these are new scenarios. We're not, these are things that we're, each and every individual case can be a new type of scenario. So like you mentioned, and we, a lot of people mentioned this, but the educative leaders, those make or break an experience. You mentioned the head of school changed and the experience was completely different. We've recently, for example, had a change in, 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 in educative leaders as well, and you can see the amount of importance a person's personal values give towards um, teaching the staff and, uh, and helping them with the right appropriate means to be here, for example, today. I'm meant to be at school today. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. And that is a, a very, very important aspect because we are, as educators, also learning with the parents. We're learning how we can support the parents, how we can support our students in class. So it's a, a gradual process and time. Time is the most important thing. Time, everyone, it, it, you mentioned a parent who makes you angry, who angers you. That parent is going through a lot of fear. That parent sure. is going through a lot of emotions of his own. And hopefully one day time will allow yes. him to get there. Oh my God! Yeah, uh, I think just want to hope. But time, I think, like you said, you cannot just because your time frame is this, you cannot expect your students' time frame to be the same. It's not. Everyone has their own time. True. True. Mm -hmm. Just to um, continue building on what you both said, um, as as a head of school past head of school, um, the challenges are immense. It's like, it's one of the very few occupations. So if you have a, a hotel manager, general manager, under general manager, and the very see, you know, other um, strata of how you can organize, but you are in a head of school, you are curriculum leader, HR manager, <laughs> in, especially in a church school or in a private school. Um, uh, why am I saying this? Because in the government schools, there is the, the HR part is, is only partly um, under the head. Um, so there are so many things, changes in the curriculum, I mean, this is an, an ongoing um, process which, which is never ending. So you, even the COPE sessions you are mentioning, which is the training sessions given to staff, you can have a head who is a very, um, you know, really would like to, but can only, what you can do also as a head then at that point, when you can't uh, take the, um, because you can't even give teachers training as much as you would like, exactly. because they, you are bound by union agreements which do not allow you to, to, to um, have more, but as a head you can always create spaces and make them voluntary. The people who are interested will come. The people who would never have changed would not change with a COPE session because it is compulsory, let alone. So you'd rather have, I, I take it as this slow process of uh, ripple effect. First you get on board the people who are more likely to embrace something. But as you rightly said, a head of school with the right predisposition uh, 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 makes a difference. Uh, I mean, it does. And also, I think as the challenge for schools is, um, again, parents are not all like Silvana. We have more like Silvana with the right attitude, um, but we have others who are, so we have to compensate for that lack of space at home. Uh, like we say, some children come to school to be loved. So we're not saying that parents who, are, who struggle to accept a situation do not love. But we even, we have children at school whom we need to feed. True. We're talking of basic needs. <laughs> you know, Except these are basic needs. Feel safe. Feel accepted and loved for who you are or whoever you would like to be. Huh? So I think that 
at school, a main struggle with all these things going on at school, and believe me, there's no one day like the other, and from a, your perspective, and a head's perspective, which is seeing obviously a wider, um, has a wider vision, but there are support services. A head can't do it all alone, mm -hmm. okay? A head has to reach out. Thank God there are within, um, and they are really well developed today. I mean, say the church school sector, there's a psychosocial services are ready to, ready to come in. Huh? Um, immediately they come in. Rainbow support, we reached out. I reached out because I didn't know all that much about it way back, about the situation. Or, but you reach out and you learn. And I, something my experience with rainbow support is nobody pushed anyone to be anything. <laughs> they just listen and accompany and gave advice even to how and when to come out and what not. So, so, you know. Fantastic. Ahna, we're nearing the end. I would like you to conclude if you have any concluding <laughs> remarks. And um, I think it's good that we have this space. Um, even the website, Matthew will, be, Mela, Mela, Mela. Matthew will be launching because it will be a safe space for parents who are going through different emotions. Um, so maybe they'll have their, their question. We were discussing with Matthew before this conference. For example, um, someone once told me maybe it's a phase. Mm -hmm. A parent told me it's a phase. Mm -hmm. And she was angry at herself for thinking it. Mm -hmm. But this may create a safe space for telling that mom is it's okay mm -hmm. to think that. Mm -hmm. But let's see how to go about it. So it's really good that there will be this space. We will be learning more about the space later. But the ending um, comments from Silvana. Like a couple of things. <laughs> mela, mela. Like um, Karen mentioned her perspective towards these, uh, um, uh, like, uh, I don't want to mention names, like these organizations that support uh, the LGBTIQ community. And it was also my fear that they will, would promote or encourage my son more. And recently I encountered this when I, someone texted me on Messenger and said, listen, I wish we could talk, and I called her. And she, when I mentioned that maybe after I listened like for an hour and a half, because she was so, she had such mis mixed feelings. At a point she's saying she's embracing her child, and I honestly understand her, but at the same time she's fighting over a dress. And I thought maybe I would suggest you find some professional help. And when I mentioned an organization, actually someone who comes from an owner has this background of an activist and an organization, because I'm an educator, not a therapist. She said, no, but I don't want my child to be given labels, because maybe they would tell her, you're non-binary or you're trans. And I assured her that it won't happen like that because I went through it, but she never reached back, you know? She said I would discuss that with my husband, but maybe her fear at this point in time is much sort of amplified, you know? And maybe I'll give her time and I'll check on her, so. <laughs> and we mentioned also policies, and that this is um, a new thing about uh, this gender diversity is a new thing, but we have policies, inclusion policies that date back to 2015 that safeguard gender diverse individuals. Unfortunately, and it happened very recently yesterday, an educator mocked about having to take other male, female, other, and an educator which it is sort of, in public, anyone can look for these policies. And one of the inclusion policy, even in, an, in a diagram that has this diversity wheel, one section is supporting gender diverse students. So it's there, black and white, you know? Inclusion, it's not about having a student with learning difficulties or with different abilities. It's also having gender diverse individuals in the classroom. Okay. And as an educator, and even as an educator myself, you know, we are obliged to provide a safe environment at school. Sure. While with so many things that we can do, even with representation other 
other diversities through our work in class, through stories, through books. But some people, unfortunately, and some schools and some school administrations, not all, thankfully, are still very afraid to do so. Exactly. But hopefully with people like you, with educators like you, and with all the professionals present today, things will change and will do better. Hopefully, I would like to really thank you. It was really interesting. Hope you found it interesting as much as I did. And thank you for all your work. Please put your hands together for our guests. discuss uh, there are gluten-free and uh, vegetarian options as well so we have half an hour break outside and then we come in and continue with the conference thank you so much for your attention